on Saturday nights, I drink soda and I eat Rocky Road ice cream. He curls up on the... I've always been fascinated by literary dreams. I mean, in, in real life, of course, we have no idea what dreams mean, if they mean anything at all, uh, and, and probably never will get much closer to it, uh, despite all Freud's efforts, despite all the uh, research in, in the physiology of, of, of dreaming during, uh, by monitoring brains. We really do not know why dreaming happens or what dreams mean, if anything. But in literary terms, because there's an author of a story, a dream in a story is always capable of meaning something, and indeed, if it isn't going to mean something, there's no point in putting it in the story at all. So the literary dream is, is a particular kind of literary device uh, for adding meaning to the story, or for, for connecting up bits of the story, which has always seemed to me to be very interesting in those terms and, and quite fascinating. And in quite a lot of my stories, I've tried to rig up a situation whereby dreams really could come to mean something so that in the werewolves of London and the Angel of Pain, uh, the contact with the peculiar beings, they eventually turn out to be aliens, but at the beginning they look, uh, look like uh, supernatural beings, um, is, is, is through the medium of dreaming. And that the, the very process of having one's normal dreams invaded by these meaningful dreams becomes for the characters in werewolves of London a particularly significant and a particularly disturbing thing. All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. So wrote a teenager named Eddie Poe way back whenever. Ah, oh, thank you, Nancy. When we dream, the strange, the bizarre, the impossible are commonplace, just as they are in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. For example, Edgar Allan Poe went on to write a dread-filled, dreamlike poem about falling off to sleep and encountering a raven with a one-word vocabulary. Nancy, remember what the raven quotes? Nevermore. Never mind. The idea that dreams could be stories was the basis of one of the earliest comic strips, Little Nemo in Slumberland. Each week, Little Nemo had a wild one-page adventure with the same ending. He woke up. Using that simple formula and an Art Nouveau style, Winsor McKay created some wonderfully imaginative stories. One contemporary comic book that treats dreams with equal originality is, you guessed it, The Sandman. Neil Gaiman faxed me up some artwork this morning from the new storyline, and it looks great. I talked to Neil last month, I guess just before he dreamed up this story. With a title like The Sandman, I assume that your dreams influence your writing? Yes, definitely. But I don't remember many of my dreams. Dreams are weird things. Dreams... We spend a huge quantity of our lives, you know, a third of our lives asleep. A good percentage of that time we spend dreaming. And yet we write it off. We forget about it. And it can be really bizarre talking to people about their dreams and the strange recognitions. You can talk to people about how you'll be dreaming about walking into your kitchen and you're going to take out the garbage and you move. You move this big plastic trash can and you notice behind it there's a swimming pool you hadn't seen before. And you thought, isn't that interesting? There's a swimming pool in my kitchen. Why didn't anybody tell me that? Um, this is perfect dream logic. It's not story logic. It's very, very hard to convey in story form. Um, Rick Veach, creator of Brat Pack and many other things, has been doing a comic called Rabbit Things, which he basically does by doing a comic of his dream when he wakes up in the morning do a six-panel version of his dream. These are strange, terrifying, bizarre things in which his friends weave in and out. He showed me one at San Diego in which I turn up at his house dressed as Uncle Fester with a light bulb in my mouth. Um, they aren't stories. What, what they are is something completely other. So, Neil, what new dreams have you got coming up for us in The Sandman? 
there are two stories that follow distant mirrors. There's a Sandman special. And the Sandman special is a 48-page story drawn by Brian Talbot, inked by Mark Buckingham. I think it's going to be really nice. And it's the story of Orpheus. The Sandman special, which uh, I'm inking over Brian Talbot pencils, is basically a retelling of, of the story of Orpheus and the underworld. You get this feeling that Orpheus goes to see death and she allows him to never be able to die in order to go into hell to save his wife and try and bring her back. And all along the way, you, you get the feeling that really if he just sort of sat down and tried to come to terms with his grief and go on with his life, things would have been far better, but his, his desire to keep pursuing this, this idealized vision of his wife ends up destroying him. He lives alone on an a island with just the animals for company, playing his lyre, and eventually is, is torn apart. And Of course, he cannot die, and it's just his, his head left there on the beach, but uh, you, you kind of feel like he deserved it, which is a bit nasty, really, but... Uh, it was, a, it was an interesting story to do. And I'm also starting a storyline, a new one, which is currently called The Game of You. And The Game of You... Game of You actually is an interesting sort of story because it's a storyline I, I threw away about two and a half years ago after reading a novel by Jonathan Carroll, Bones of the Moon. And it was a very unpleasant experience reading this book not because I enjoyed it a great deal, but I did, not because it wasn't a brilliant book, because it was, but because it was so close in, in feeling and occasionally even in structure to what I'd wanted to do with this storyline about this woman and her dream life, this woman, this very bland, dull woman, and this incredibly beautiful, rich dream life, and this sort of dream quest she was on to save the dream world. And I sort of tried to do the whole storyline in one page in the middle of a doll's house, which is by Barbie. It's incredibly boring. But Barbie? Barbie, of uh, Ken and Barbie, oh. um, has these wonderful dreams. And you just get a couple of pages of it in Sandman 15. And at the end of the storyline, she's out of it. She goes off and does whatever she does. But it's been two and a half years now, and I still wondered what happened to her. I kept wondering what happened to her. And finally, I think I know. So I've just started. And the story is going to be about Barbie's dreams? Well, it's not so much about her dreams as about this dream world. She used to have these wonderful dreams where every night she'd visit this magical world and she was on a quest to save it. And then she stopped dreaming. But the dream world's carried on dying and they want her back. And it's about Barbie and it's about the people who live in the house she lives in in New York and it's about it's about cuckoos and princesses and it's called the game of you great Neil you gotta fax me up some of the artwork when it's done Sigmund Freud dreamt that he was young again and young dreamt that he wasn't a Freud and Carl and Siggy both what the heck is going on hello 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 Oh, oh, it's just a... Greetings, prisoners of gravity. Let's talk about dreams. Dreams are gateways to magical realities, which makes them a natural vehicle for fantasy fiction. Alice in Wonderland, Dorothy and Oz, Bobby Ewing in Dallas. I watched a Twilight Zone festival the other night from a little station out of Regina. They promised ten classic episodes in five hours. So I tune in, and four of the first five ended with... Oh, it was all just a dream. Four of the first five episodes. I dozed off. But some writers, like fantasy author Charles DeLint, use dreams for more than just an easy ending. Nevermore. Why are dreams so important in your fiction? Because it is something else that people have pointed out to me, and I've actually got a little self-conscious about that now. I go, uh-oh, there's a dream sequence happening here. Maybe I shouldn't do it. Um, <clears throat> I guess, you know, to be real honest with you, I, it's, in one sense, it's convenient. It's a convenient way, especially if you're writing a contemporary book, it's a convenient way to get out and do something weird without breaking the rules of the real world, in a sense. Um, 
also the whole idea of dreams. I, I just like the idea of, you know, we were talking about the Sandman comic. I mean, that's the, the world of dreams. It's, there's something about dreams that, that are, that's fascinating. Um, you know, you, you wake up in the morning or you're having this dream, you wake up and it's just the most amazing thing. You know, the most wonderful things happen probably in the space of two minutes, but it felt like, you know, three years you were in that dream. And it's, it's, it blows me away how, how quickly it fades, how quickly it's gone. It just sort of, you know, it's, it has a real kind of that, that whole sense of, of fairy about it. Because uh, it's one of the things in fairy a lot of people would forget immediately, you know. It's, it's an amazing occurrence. You can't believe that they would ever forget it. And yet something to do with some of the, the, the glamour of fairy is that, that people forget about it. They just, they lose it. Dreams are the same way. And I guess we... In a way, books are like dreams, you know, it's, except that we're controlling them. Actually, you can control your dreams. One way to end a cycle of nightmares is to turn and confront whatever is chasing you, which is good advice for real life, too. That feeling of being helpless to control events, of memory slipping away, was captured by Kim Stanley Robinson in his story, Before I Wake. Scientists fight a constant losing battle to stay awake against the mysterious force that's overwhelming them. Reality slips into unreality. Action drains into aimless wandering, gives way to apathy. Memories fade, paranoia, claustrophobia. This short story comes closest to catching the bizarre dream logic, the weird cascading imagery, and the terrible ennui of nightmares. Well, my nightmares, anyway. Another writer who gives people nightmares with his nightmares is Clive Barker. Weave World Cabal and The Great and Secret Show are horror stories involving fantasy, but with his new book, Imagica, Clive is a, a fabulist whose fantasy incorporates horror. The setting is very complex. Earth is one of five parallel universes called Dominions, and Clive's characters leave Earth, travels through the other dimensions before returning home. Clive's imagery is at its vivid best, and the book is laced with dreams. Uh, the book is very much about shamanism. It's very much about about the shamanistic journey in one way or another. Shamanism in, in affects me and interests me more and more. And the idea that uh, of, of the shaman and the parallel between the writer or the artist and the shaman, the, the, the person who is elected by the tribe or self-elected in the case of the writer, to uh, take a dream journey on behalf of the tribe, to go uh, into some dreamscape and return from that dreamscape with information which will be useful to the tribe. Uh, philosophically, metaphysically, socially useful. Um, that's a very intriguing uh, drama. And what's happening in, uh, in, in a magica is that a, a character, in fact, several characters are, are taking that sort of journey and coming back with various kinds of information. Why does the shaman have to go into a dream landscape for this kind of information? The shaman goes into a dream landscape as opposed to going to Poland or, you know, um, Melbourne, because the, uh, the levels at which he can interpret the world are at least as much metaphorical as actual. And, you know, uh, reality can be, uh, that is solid, um, unmetaphorical reality can be uh, uh, reductionist, but when you need insight into what's going on inside you, or maybe insight into the relationship you have with the universe, with the larger world, um, those hard lines, the fact that the chair is the chair and, and you are flesh and they are separate things, becomes um, uh, almost offensive. Uh, it it's makes makes me feel claustrophobic. I need the the I need the insights that uh, I can get from going into a world in which these kind of definitions soften the way they do in dreams, in which you can be both in the chair and of the chair. In our century, we've, we've become somewhat preoccupied by the idea, particularly in literature and, and, and in movies, of seeing the world um, in a certain kind of way and, and valuing its solidity. Um, 
not really wanting to tear the veils open, not really wanting to peer beyond. And the fantastique, science fiction, fantasy, science fiction, horror, uh, are genre which have always celebrated the turning of veils, have always celebrated the possibility of going, um, uh, stepping beyond the solid and into the dreamscape beyond. Uh, because there was more truth, and a capital T here, in the higher reality, capital H, capital R, of the dreamscape than, the, than there was in the so-called real world uh, which the writer was leaving. Shamans aren't the only ones who can find meaning in their dreams. Last year, I managed to downlink to horror writer Peter Straub. You might remember we talked about his novels Coco and Mystery. And I asked him how his dreams influenced his writing. Oh, that's a good question. Nobody ever asked me that. Uh, sometimes dreams speak to me very directly about what I'm writing. N not because they concern, uh, in a direct sense, the characters or setting that I'm writing about at the moment, but because in an elusive, metaphoric way, they tell me what to do next. Uh, the, the best example of this is in Coco. Uh, when I had a dream that really told me something that I already knew but had forgotten. And it was so powerful a moment that I put the dream right into the book. I, I had forgotten that when I was planning Coco, uh, that I'd given Michael Poole a dead child. Uh, he was much more grotesquely uh, formed um, it, uh, because of Agent Orange in the early version than he than it turned out, then he turned out to be in the book when he uh, simply seemed retarded, mildly retarded, and developed brain cancer. Anyhow, I had Michael Poole in a terrible marriage that, that was really frozen in some sense. Uh, this, the, the, there seemed an, an unimaginable, almost inexplicable degree of bad feeling in that marriage. And I was very far along in the book. Anyhow, I dreamed of a small boy and a, and a rabbit, the boy's side, uh, standing along the side of a road holding lanterns. In the, in the dream, these, these images came from a painting called Into the Darkness that I had stepped into. And I was driving in a car down the road, down this road, and I saw far ahead of me these two lanterns. And when I drove up, there was a tender boy of about five or six holding a lantern next to a rabbit, his size, holding a lantern. The next day I wandered around, I was doing some shopping, and I remembered the dream, and I, I thought, oh, that's Michael Poole's son, and he's dead, and that's why their marriage is so terrible, because they never forgave each other. Uh, they never got over the, the unhappiness. Um, anyhow, the dream struck me as so beautiful, anyhow, that I put it straight in the cocoa, uh, you know, months later, when, when I reached an appropriate point. But when I had that dream, I knew that I was on target. Lisa Tuttle's story, A Spaceship Built of Stone, is about an alien invasion. The hero of the story has strange dreams about an ancient lost city in the desert. A lot of his friends have the exact same dream. It turns out aliens are manipulating everyone's dreams, using them to subconsciously convince humanity into accepting them. It almost works. Eventually, everyone believes the aliens were sort of always there. But our hero realizes that we're being brainwashed. How does he know? He's been keeping a dream diary. A lot of writers keep dream diaries. I asked a few how useful they are. Nancy, hit the highlights. I think a dream diary is healthy, if, whether you're a writer or not. Uh, I do use dreams to plot. And I had, I don't know if, if you're familiar, I did a, a novella and a novel called Junction. I had been having trouble for about a month and a half ending, ending it. And I lay down in my bed and I was thinking about the book and I fell asleep and I sensed this flash of light, which was probably the light bulb above my bed. In those days I had about three dollars a month for rent, so this was not a spectacular apartment. And I jerked up and in that almost blinding flash, the entire end, in all of its permutations, was right there. All of the philosophical stuff, uh, and it, it's, it, it's a complex novel. I don't uh, 
dream entire plots, but I think it's safe to say that uh, all 980 pages of my fat novel, Caring Comfort, came from a single image of dream of an elderly lady with a shawl running through a forest with a helicopter after her. I remember thinking, I don't remember most of my dreams, I remember that specific image stuck with me, and why would a helicopter be chasing this little lady? Well, about 700 pages later, I, I knew. I don't actually keep a dream diary faithfully, but um, there, was, there was a dream not too long ago that woke me up at 4 in the morning, and I, you know, I grabbed for my paper and pen. I always have something to write on next to the bed, and, you know, I outlined the novel and then went back to sleep, and then I woke up a few hours later and I thought, Oh, I'm almost afraid to look at it because, you know, what if I look at it and it's really stupid, you know, because dreams seem so, you know, compelling when you first wake up, you know, and so I picked it up and I read it and it was still great, you know, so I outlined it and my publisher's going to take a look at it now and, you know, if it sells, it'll be the first novel I ever wrote based on a dream, although, I've, you know, I've written stories that have had their beginnings in, in dreams. Well, yeah, a diary of anything that comes into your head that's useful, write it down straight away. Take Duke Ellington's advice. Never let an idea get away from you. If, I mean, I came out without a pen today. What if, first time ever, I think, and uh, what if I'd got an idea and couldn't write it down? You see, you must, you must keep a note of anything that might be useful. That's absolutely essential. My dreams are extremely banal. I mean, I will dream that I'm, I've spent 20 minutes waiting for the number 11 to come along which of course is always tr predictable and always true. You dream it in the morning and you go and do it in the afternoon. Um, but that, that's, those are my dreams. You know, my dreams are going around the supermarket and not being able to find a certain kind of cheese. Um, I really have the most absolutely banal dreams. So I think of dreams as being something very banal. <laughs> and, not, and nothing to do with real life. Um, and not as interesting as real life. It's, it's a peculiar. I think I think if you sort of if you if you make a business of selling your dreams, you know, you're dredging up everything. You got nothing left to, you know, in in, in your subconscious. I don't know. It's, it's all struck me as being odd that, but I do have extremely boring dreams. Michael Moorcock dreams about buying cheese. Michael Moorcock, author of stories like Behold the Man, where a time traveler has himself crucified in Christ's place, or his series about the bloody adventures of the red-eyed albino warrior Elric or the final program full of decadence, corruption, and violence, he dreams about buying cheese? I bet it's head cheese. Actually, I keep a dream diary. Every morning, I dictate my dreams to Nancy. Well, and then the weirdest part, Liz Taylor was marrying a construction worker at Michael Jackson's house. And I was there, back on Earth, and my date was Lisa Simpson, only she was made out of ketchup bottles, so when you squeezed her, Mayor McCheese was running for president against Dan Quayle, and I was there, back on Earth. Mmm, this is damn fine coffee, Nancy. Give me a slice of your cherry pie, would you? With Mark Garneau and Mila Mulrooney and Gumby, and they invited me onto the space shuttle, and then we flew back to Earth. So I said, beam me down, Scotty, and he did, and then suddenly, I was back on Earth. Dream diaries may be helpful, but writers don't dream up a whole story, wake up, dash over to the typewriter, and spew out a 600-page novel. The painful process of crafting science fiction stories is detailed by Brian Aldiss in his book, Bury My Heart at W.H. Smith. A friend faxed me up a few chapters. Here's one where Brian Aldiss talks about dreams he had in his childhood. In one dream, I lay helpless in bed, knowing that a deity stood at the other end of the corridor, beyond my bedroom door. That deity was after me for a reason of its own. It had merely to run down the corridor and snatch me out of bed. It could run infinitely fast. It started running with a machine-like motion. The distance of the corridor was no distance, yet it was also infinite. A terrifying corridor, at least as dreary and forbidding as the deity. This contradictory visitant I was forced to await, powerless, prone in bed, over several years intermittently, though he never troubled me once I left that room. So naturally, when I talked to Brian yesterday, I asked him about dreams. I wrote a novel, a contemporary novel, five years ago, called Forgotten Life. And I didn't know how to start on that novel. And then one afternoon, I was walking in my garden, and I thought of the old Descartes maxim. I I think, therefore I am. 
and I saw that there was an addendum to that. I think, therefore I am. I dream, therefore I become. <gasps> that was what I needed on the title page. That was the imprimatur of the book. I was so delighted. I typed it out and took the afternoon off. <laughs> I hear Randy Descartes took the whole day off. Does the idea of dreams often affect you that way? I'm not particularly a dreamy person, but I do believe that dreams are one way in which uh, you communicate with something inside you, or to put it the other way, that something inside you communicates with you. And uh, you know, most dreams are trivial, but there are occasions when dreams mean a great deal, i.e. when they come from a, a more important department of the psyche, if you'll excuse the term. And I've had dreams like that. And I think that uh, this is where I part company from many science fiction writers, uh, that I don't write much about technology. I'm more interested in what happens to humanity inwardly and what they become. So, I mean, this is why, gradually, my writing becomes more psychological, uh, more philosophical, more boring. What can you say? No one knows why you dream. Is it simply the mind's bulk erasing? Or is it edited highlights? Or is it the ultimate in vision TV? Whatever dreams are, we need them. But we need dreams when we're awake, too. Daydreams, dreams of what might be possible someday to dream the impossible dream. After all, a dream without new possibilities, where we're trapped in the same situation over and over again, powerless to change. That isn't a dream, that's a nightmare. Second nature, sleepwalking people have eaten meals, visited friends, even committed crimes. But could sleepwalking explain the 80s?